our heads for prayer. Lord, we want to look at a lesson from your word and pray that you would help us understand what you're saying and take something from it that's of value and use to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6. It's a prophecy of the Messiah. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool. The thirsty land, oh, sorry, I, mean, I meant five and six, I got six and seven. Verse five, then shall the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. That's what the Messiah would do. And if you read the Gospels, you see that Jesus walked right through each one of those. He healed the blind, he healed the deaf, he healed the lame, he healed the dumb. I want to take you to one of those experiences, Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Beginning in verse 32. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more they widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Did you catch that? He spat, touched his tongue. What was that about? We're going to come back to that. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. For me, it's just right across the page. Then he came to, came to Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida is a little town on the north end of the Sea of Galilee, very near to Capernaum. Uh, it was the hometown to several of the disciples. Uh, Peter, James, John, Andrew, uh, and I think at least an, one of the other disciples all came from this one little fishing village up on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. He came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had, spat on his, had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on, him again, on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. What is with that? What do you see? I see men like trees walking. Touches him again and he sees fine. I have to say, when re I read that for many years, I kind of cringed every time I read this story. It's like, ooh, bad fumble, but a nice recovery. You hate to see your side fumble the ball, especially when it's Jesus doing it. Now, eventually, it kind of came to me to... to ask a few crucial questions, like, one, does God make mistakes? Does God make mistakes? No, no. Oh, 
So if this isn't a mistake, it's intentional. It looks bad. It's looked bad for nearly 2,000 years. You, you couldn't get it right on the first try. Now, interestingly, all the other blind people that Jesus healed, there's nothing like this. They're just healed. They're just healed. But this one, I see men like trees walking. Back in the 1990s, there's a fellow, I think his uh, pseudonym was Virgil. He had bad cataracts. He'd had them since he was very, very young. Could not see. They thought he was blind completely. But doing a little testing, they discovered he actually had some light sensitivity, so they did an operation. And voila, he could see. Well, sort of. His eyes functioned and sent the signal to his brain. But his brain had not processed visual sing signals in such a long time, it had no idea how to make it a, an image out of it in the brain. He had a cat. And he could tell immediately by feeling whether it was the cat or the dog. <laughs> just, just touch him and he knows what, what it is. After his surgery, when he looked at the cat, he could see an ear or a face or a tail or a leg, but his mind could not put it together as a cat. He was almost sorry that he ever had the surgery. It was such a mental confusion to him because his brain could not process the signal. It's called visual agnosia. The brain doesn't know. Agnosia. No knowledge of what to do with it. What's interesting with the man at Bethsaida when he says, I see men like trees walking, that's exactly how Virgil described his experiences of trying to see when his brain didn't know what to do with it. And apparently what Jesus did at Bethsaida was he healed the eyeballs so they could send the signal to the brain, but he did not heal the brain. He stopped right there and said, I want you to take a minute and tell us what you see right here, right now. And he says, I see men like trees walking. It's visual confusion, a lot of color, a lot of motion, but nothing makes any sense. And then Jesus put his hands back on him and, whoo, he can see perfectly. What did Jesus do this time? Healed the brain so he could process the image. He usually did them together in one sweep. Did the whole thing. And you can just see. And that's what we usually expect. But this time he stopped in the middle and he said, I want you to tell us what the middle is like. Because 2,000 years from now, there's going to be people who will know what this means. You don't know what this means. And the people around us don't know what this means. But they'll get it. They'll get it. When I read the story of Virgil, I went, oh my. So Jesus not only knew that it was a two-step healing process, one for the eyes, one for the brain. He stopped in the middle to show us that he knew it was one for the eyes and one for the brain and got a description of it so we would recognize it when we get to our end of history. I think that's cool. He was talking to us when he did that. Now there's another cool thing that that does for us. There are people who think there's nothing truly miraculous anywhere in Scripture. It's all just made-up stories. I want to tell you that if anybody made up this story of the healing of the blind man, they wouldn't make it say what it says. Because nobody from Jesus' day till the 1700s had a clue that the healing of the eyeball and the healing of the brain were two different things. In the 1700s, they got the concept. Somebody says, hey, you know what? I think problems with the eyeball and problems with the brain 
can both independently be involved with blindness. You got two things here. They got to connect them, both work together. That's when they first got the concept. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, 1900s that anybody actually had an experience that demonstrated it that, that we're aware of. But now we get it. The midpoint was unknown until the 1700s. And therefore, in Jesus' day, that story could not be faked in that form because nobody knew that there was that form to fake. They didn't know you could do this in a two-step thing. So they would not have written the story that way. Very cool to me that here is a story of a miracle that is self-authenticating in modern understanding. Didn't make sense for 2,000 years. Looked crazy. Looked like a fumble. Oh, no. Oh, no. There's no fumble. There's a deliberate message to us. I know what's going on here. And nobody from there till here could write the story the way it is because they didn't know that it could happen that way. They didn't know. And he used what to heal the guy? Spit. What's with this spit thing? We're about to go find out what's with this spit thing. John chapter 9. The man born blind. John chapter 9. I'm going to start in verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was born, sorry, who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. In their culture, you always had to assign a reason for why trouble came to people. Was it your fault or your parents' fault? Born blind, it's kind of iffy that it's his fault, right? He's not done anything yet. How can it be his fault? Maybe God is punishing his parents for their sins. So that's the question they're asking. Check out Jesus' answer in verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Not his fault. Not his parents' fault. God let it happen to show his works. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground, made clay with the saliva, anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. He went and washed and came back seen. Pool of Siloam is the pool at the end of Hezekiah's tunnel. Been there since Old Testament times. There was an attack expected. I think it was the Assyrians. Uh, And Hezekiah knew that the spring that provided most of the water for Jerusalem was at the bottom of the hill, actually outside the wall of the city, which is kind of halfway up the hill. And usually ancient cities would be put on a hill near a spring. You want water and you want a defensible position. But usually the spring is down and the city is up. And so it always created interesting challenges in ancient times. Sometimes they would tunnel it under to a large uh, uh, set of stairs that would go down inside the city. Uh, In the case of Jerusalem, it was still kind of accessible to the outside. They did have... A, a, a tunnel that went under the city wall, and you, you could drop a bucket down a shaft. But there's only, only so many buckets an hour you can drop down that shaft and pull up, and it's not enough to keep everybody in Jerusalem alive. There's more water down there, but you can't get it up the way it's designed. So Hezekiah dug a tunnel and made a pool inside the city so all the water would come inside the city to the pool where it's much easier to get to and everybody can get water. You can make use of all the water you got. You needed to do that. Plus, then you can cover it over on the outside, plant a bush there, and the other guys don't know where the water is. Cool. 
you got the water, they don't have the water, and you get all the water. It was a very good thing. That's the pool of Siloam where Jesus sent the blind man. But here, again, he spits, he makes clay, puts it on the blind man's eyes. He goes and washes and comes back, and he can see. What's with the spit? Never made sense to me. The closest I could come to anything that had a whisper of a chance of making sense was, maybe the clay has something to do with natural remedies. I don't know. But then, one of my seminary professors shared with me something that the rabbis in Jesus' day said. They said, of the Messiah, Messiah will be so great that his spit will give sight to the blind. His what? His spit will give sight to the blind. So what did Jesus do in Jerusalem under the nose of the leaders in Jerusalem in public with a beggar whom everybody's seen begging by the side of the road? In fact, the neighbors afterwards say, hey, isn't that the blind man? Some of them say, yeah, that's the blind man. And none of them said, hey, it looks a lot like him, but man, it doesn't look the same. You've seen blind people? My, My mom had macular degeneration. And in the early years, She still looked like a person who could see. But eventually, she looked like a person who couldn't see. You just looked at her, and you knew she couldn't see. There's something about the the face of a blind person. I I only knew one blind fellow who could fool me. Uh, He'd look you right in the eye when he talked to you. You thought he was looking at you. He couldn't see anything. (laughs) But he'd learned how to look right in your eye and, and it looked like he could see. Other than that, I have never seen anybody who could do that. So the neighbors were seeing the change in his face. Uh, and uh, he said, eh, it's me, it's me. Jesus, right there in Jerusalem, had said, do you want to know who I am? Watch what my spit does for this blind man. Now, he kind of camouflaged it a little, mixed it with the clay, put it on, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And it happens over there. Right? And he comes back seeing. But it's pretty undeniable. What did my spit do for a blind man? It made him see. Now, when you don't want to believe something, it's amazing the lengths which a person will go to to deny the obvious. The Pharisees in Jerusalem were were incredible with that. Um, Verse 13. They brought him who was formerly blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. You see the problem that's going to rise for the Pharisees. It's the Sabbath and they're they're, going to lose track of the main point. Right at that point, they're going to get into the, he was breaking the Sabbath. The Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes, I now washed, and I see. So the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? See the Pharisees' problem? It's like, so he's not keeping the Sabbath, at least in their opinion. But how can you do it if you don't have God's power? This is a pretty crazy thing to do if you're not working under God's power. Hmm. What's, how are you going to reconcile those? They're having a problem here. They really are. There was a division among them. So they said to the blind man, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. He said, he's a prophet. Now, interesting, when this whole thing started out and the man was sitting by the side of the road, The disciples say to Jesus, who sinned, this guy or his parents? And Jesus said, neither one. I'm going to show God's glory. Makes the clay, puts it on the guy's eyes, and says, go wash in the pool. That's the first interaction with the guy himself is when Jesus says to him, puts the clay and says, go wash. They don't even talk to him. They're talking about him, right over him in his presence, like like he's a stone or something. (laughs) 
He's not part of the conversation. They, they don't address him. They talk to each other about him in his presence. It's kind of weird, actually, if you think about it. Uh, they, they treated him as many cultures treat handicapped people. Uh, they're kind of not there. Uh, and, and Jesus' disciples did the same thing, and Jesus plays along with it. Now, one of the things that I find very, very interesting is Jesus, on this occasion, did not ask for any demonstration or expression of faith from this guy before he healed him. He almost always did. He almost always asked for some expression of faith. In this case, he just makes the clay, puts it on his eyes and says, go wash. And he washed and he came back seeing. Um, I find that interesting. I think one thing it says is God can heal without our faith, right? He doesn't hardly ever. Usually, he asks for our faith because this is not about his power. It's about our relationship to him and his power. And our relationship of faith is essential for it to be a blessing to us in the big sense. If it's going to be more than just the healing of the eyeball, there's got to be faith, right? And this guy comes to faith, full, full-blown faith. But at its essence, God can do whatever he chooses. He can heal you if you don't want him to. He rarely intervenes in somebody's life when we don't want him. He usually respects that pretty carefully, but he can. He can do it without our faith. It's not, it's not that he needs our faith to do it. We need our faith to be blessed by what he does, right? We need the faith to be blessed by what he does. So, while he's with the uh, Pharisees, he says, I think he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been born blind and received his sight. Until he called the parents of him who had received his sight. That's interesting. Here is a well-witnessed public miracle. The man himself saying, yes, it's me. I was blind. He put clay on my eyes. I washed. I can see. I don't know how that worked, but that's what happened. <laughs> They've got the testimony, but they don't believe it. Why not? Because it puts them in a logical bind in their own minds. It's not keeping Sabbath. It takes God's power to do it. And we don't know how to put those together. It must not be true. So they call his parents in. And his parents are scared because there's already word out, if you support Jesus, you get kicked out of the synagogue. So they say, um, is this your son who you say was born blind? Notice how they phrased that. They didn't say, is this your son who was born blind? Is this your son who you claim was born blind? How does he now see? His parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. They knew. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. They were scared of getting kicked out of the synagogue. Said, They're not going to answer beyond, yes, that's our son. Yes, he was born blind. That leaves the Pharisees in the exact same spot they were in. <laughs> didn't help him a bit, because it is their son. He was born blind. You still got that same problem. So they called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know this man is a sinner. And he says, I don't know if he's a sinner. But what I do know, I was blind. Now I see. 
Uh, and they asked him again, so what did he do? How did he open your eyes? They're trying to dig into it, to, something to help them understand this. It's not going to come out understanding the way they want it to. We know it's not. But they're digging, right? They're digging. Now, how did he do that? And he said, I already told you. You guys wanted to be his disciples? Hmm. That made him mad. <laughs> so they reviled him, and he said, you are his disciple. We're Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. We don't know where this is from. And here's where the blind man gets eloquent. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing that you don't know where he's from, but he opened my eyes. Now, we know that God does not hear sinners. God does not respond to now, I, I think there's exceptions to this, but this is the standard belief in Jewish culture at least. God does not respond to people who are out of harmony with him and do what they want him to do. Uh, God's not at the command of people out of harmony with him. And there's a lot of truth in that. I think there's some exceptions in it. God does listen to sinners when they call on him. But he says... If anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Now, I think that is true. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. There, he's 100% correct. This man was not from God. He could not have done this. I was born blind. People born blind do not get healed. Doctors and nobody else, they can't do it. Only God can do it. This guy did it. He did it with God's power. He's from God. Uh, he, he's got that correct. They answered him and said, you were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. That is, they kicked him out of the synagogue. Excommunicated. Uh, then Jesus finds him and says, do you believe in the Son of God? He says, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? He says, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Interesting that Jesus accepts his worship. Doesn't say, oh, no, don't you do that, like John says, to, is told by the angel in Revelation. Don't be worshiping me. I am a fellow servant with you. But Jesus lets him do that because Jesus is God. For judgment I have come into this world that they, those who do not see may see, that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Their question was, are we blind? He didn't answer it directly, did he? But if you chase the string around the tree, <laughs> you discover that Jesus is saying, if you were blind, you would have no sin. That is, if you're physically blind, something you can't control. But now you say, we see, so your sin remains. You are guilty. Yes, you're guilty of not seeing what you don't want to see. You're choosing your blindness, and, and you are guilty. Um, back in verse 3, who sinned, this man or his parents? Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Suffering is not always the direct result of personal sin. Some is, but often not. Often it's you live in a world of sin. Uh, most of the people, maybe I would say pretty much all the people who get coronavirus, it's not a direct result of their sin. It's because we're living in a world that's filled with coronaviruses as a result of sin. We're living in a world that has sin. We get caught in the crossfire. Um, sin affects more broadly than just the one who sinned. Sin is not that polite or fair to restrict its damage to the guilty who deserve it. <laughs> it's not polite. It's not fair. It's everybody. Uh, indiscriminately. Uh, and, and Jesus says, this is to reveal the works of God. Ultimately, it shows God's glory. 
And if you stop and think about it, on the larger scale, the whole plan of salvation in response to sin in this world has as one of its final goals to show us the goodness of God in all of his dealings with sin. So as God allows Satan and sin time to show themselves as what they are, in the end, all of God's dealings with sin and sinners show us the goodness of God. It makes God look good. If we see it clearly through his perspective. In this story, we see faith deepening. The blind man, I don't know who he is. I don't know where he is. I don't know. He, my eyes work now. To He's a prophet. To uh, He's from God. Couldn't do it if he wasn't. To the Christ, it's you, and he worships. He comes to full faith in Jesus before it's done. Jesus gives vision. Physical and spiritual. Most of us don't need physical vision restored. But we all need spiritual vision. And that's his specialty as well. Uh, and, and remember now, when you get to that part about he spit, what's the spit thing? That's, he's talking to the Jews with that one. Because that's what their rabbis said. The Messiah will be so great that his spit will give sight to the blind. And just for good measure, he flew through in the deaf-mute while he was at it. The blind, the deaf, the mute, healed them all with his spit, just so you'd know who I really am, he says. I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you who I am. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you that you have the power to cure and heal anything that sin has damaged. I thank you that we know that you have the power to fix everything with or without our consent or our faith, but that you have chosen to do it with our faith so that we can be blessed as well. Teach us to have that faith in you each and every day, that your blessings will be more than physical to us, that they will be eternal spiritual blessings in our walk with you. In Jesus' name.